Hi everyone. In this video we're going to be looking at something that's very fundamental in mathematics but that you may not be so familiar with. It's called modular arithmetic and it's quite different than the arithmetic we're used to. Strange things can happen in it like 1 plus 1 can equal 2 but it also plays an important role in the modern world ensuring that our emails can't be read by third parties that uh, money transfers over the internet can't be altered, and in the technologies of Bitcoin and blockchain. So are you ready? Let's go. To warm up, we'll first work with a set of numbers that we're all familiar with, fractions. As you know, a fraction is a pair of numbers expressed in the form a over b, where a and b are any integers except that b can't be zero. You also know that some fractions, such as a half and two quarters, are the same. In this case, both have the decimal value 0.5. If fractions a over b and c over d are equivalent, then we can write that a over b equals c over d. And when we cross multiply, we get the result that a times d equals b times c. In maths, this kind of relationship between two pairs of numbers is known as a binary relation. We say that there's a binary relation in the set of fractions. It satisfies the following properties. First, every fraction is equivalent to itself. Second, if the fraction a over b is equivalent to the fraction c over d, then we can turn this around and say that c over d is equivalent to a over b. Third, for three fractions, a over b, c over d, and e over f, if a over b is equivalent to c over d, and c over d is equivalent to e over f, then a over b is equivalent to e over f. The first property is called the reflexive property, the second the symmetric property, and the third the transitive property. Any binary relation defined on a set that satisfies these three properties is called an equivalence relation. So the equivalence of fractions is an equivalence relation in the set of fractions. How is an equivalence relation useful? Well, we can group related elements together and represent them by a single representative element. It's a case of one for all, like the three musketeers. These representative elements form what's called the quotient set of an equivalence relation. In the case of fractions, we group them so that in each group we have all the equivalent fractions. This is the quotient set, the elements of which are the rational numbers. Then we choose a representative of each rational number, which is the irreducible fraction. In the case of the result being negative, the minus appears in the numerator. OK, now let's focus on a different example, the days of the week. And let's build an equivalence relation and a quotient set for this. First, we'll number the days and list them in an orderly way, starting with 0 for Sunday, all the way up to 6 for Saturday. What happens when on a certain day, say Tuesday, we add a number of days that's a multiple of 7? Here's Tuesday. Sunday is 0, Monday is 1, Tuesday is 2. If we add a multiple n of 7 days, we add 7n to give 2 plus 7n. The second term represents n whole weeks. Adding a week or any number of whole weeks brings us back to Tuesday. So Tuesday is obtained from any of a set of different numbers. We get Tuesday with 2 and also we put any integer value for n in 2 plus 7n. So we get Tuesday when n equals 1, giving 2 plus 7 times 1 equals 9. When n equals 2, 
giving 2 plus 7 times 2 equals 16. When n equals 3, giving 2 plus 7 times 3 equals 23. And so on. So when it comes to days of the week, 2, 9, 16 and 23 amount to the same thing. They all represent Tuesday. Because there are seven days of the week, we say that we're doing calculations modulo 7. Have you noticed something here? Behind all this are the equivalence relations. Two numbers, A and B, are related if they represent the same day. This happens, as you can see, when subtracting them gives a number that's a multiple of 7. And this is an equivalence relation. Now let's consider the quotient set. Clearly, this can be identified with the days of the week. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and Saturday. Or with their numerical representation, which we can show by the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6, usually with a bar over the top. When we work with the integers modulo 7, the only elements involved are the ones just mentioned, 0 through 6. If we have a different integer, this can be reduced modulo 7 to find the equivalent day by dividing the number by 7 and looking at the remainder. Now, still thinking about modular arithmetic applied to the days of the week, let's define two operations the sum and the product. We first carry out these operations in the usual way, but once we have the result, we reduce it modulo 7. In other words, we divide by 7 and consider only the remainder. For example, if we have 4 plus 5, we start by adding them in the usual way to get 9. Then we reduce modulo 7 to arrive at the result, namely the remainder, which is 2. In the case of multiplication, for example, 4 times 5 equals 20. And again, we reduce modulo 7. 20 divided by 7 gives a remainder of 6, which in the topsy-turvy world of modular arithmetic is our result. Both of these operations have neutral elements, elements which, when they're operated upon, leave the result the same. The neutral element of the sum is 0, and the neutral element of the product is 1, exactly as in the case of ordinary arithmetic. All elements also have an opposite. When adding opposites, you get 0. All elements in modular arithmetic, other than 0, also have an inverse. When you multiply a number by its inverse, you get 1. There are also analogous properties in modular arithmetic to the sum and product of rational and real numbers. These are the commutative, associative and distributive properties. So again, we're dealing with a set of rules that defines a field. Now let's generalize all of this. We've been talking about the days of the week, which means modulo 7. Let's broaden this to modulo n where n is any positive integer. In general, if n is a positive integer, we can define an equivalence relation in the set of the integers, z. If a and b are integers, we might say that in modular arithmetic, a is related to b if a minus b is divisible by n. More formally, we say that if a minus b is divisible by n, then A is congruent with B modulo N. Congruence is an equivalence relation. In other words, it satisfies the reflexive, symmetric and transitive properties. So we can group its elements to form what's referred to as a partition of the set of the integers. You already know that in the case when N equals 7, corresponding to the days of the week, the quotient set is the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. In the general case, the quotient set is the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, up to n minus 1, shown with a bar over the top. 
we can consider the two operations sum and product in the same way as before, except now we reduce modulo n. In other words, we divide by n and take the remainder. But there's an important point here. Before, we said that when we were dealing with modulo 7, we had a field. In general, we only end up with a field if the n in modulo n is a prime number. In every other case, there'll be non-zero elements that have no inverse. Let's end with another example, this time involving modulo 13. Because 13 is a prime number, every non-zero element will have an inverse, so we are dealing with a field. First, let's do the sum 8 plus 9 modulo 13. 8 plus 9 is 17. Then we reduce modulo 13, which means subtracting 13, to give the final result 4. Now, moving on to multiplication, 8 times 9 is 72. Next, we divide by 13. Using a calculator gives 5.53. 8, 4, 6, 1, 5, 4, and so on. And here's the trick to finishing off. We subtract the integer part, 5, and multiply by 13 to get the final result, which is 7. There's also a step-by-step -step way to arrive at the inverse of a number. It uses a well-known method of division called the Euclidean algorithm. If we're dealing with a prime number that isn't very large, we can also get the inverse by a simple process of trial and error. For example, in the case of 9, we look for a number such that when it's multiplied by 9, the result is 1 modulo 13. For instance, 9 times 3 is 27, which divided by 13 gives a remainder of 1. So the inverse of 9, shown as 9 to the minus 1, is 3. Finding the opposite is easy. First of all, reverse the sign. So in the case of uh, 8, this would be minus 8. And then just add 13 to minus 8 to give 5. So the opposite of 8, modulo 13, is 5. Well, we've covered a lot of ground here in a short time. But the idea has been to give you a, a taste for what modular arithmetic is all about. You can watch the video again if you like uh, to make sure you've understood it. And if you want to go deeper into the subject, I'd recommend any basic book on number theory or perhaps even cryptography. I hope you've enjoyed this. Leave any comments you have below. And if you haven't already, please subscribe so that you can be notified of any new videos as we upload them. Thanks very much for watching. and I'll see you again soon.